With men gaining custody of their children in only 7% of cases, Bob Geldof puts forward his own controversial case for increasing fathers' rights. The program contains some strong language. Battersea Park, Sunday lunchtime. Watch the single men with their children drag themselves through the false hours in a frantic panic of activity. The build-up, the all-week anticipation, and then the excitement of being with them. Time dripping too fast, decaying, every second measured and weighed in the balance of loss, losing, going away and fading. Everything must be crammed into this space. Life in an hour, love in a measured fragment of state-permitted time. Feed the ducks again. MacDad and McDonald's. Where else do you go? When my wife left me almost um, ten years ago now, I was bereft. I had loved her and now love had gone. And while at the time I didn't understand what was happening, one has to accept it. What bewildered me and made me grief-stricken was that not just she, but my entire family went away from me. So why were my children gone? Those things that were the best of us. Why couldn't I be with them like I had been for all their lives? I went to the law to try and be with my kids 50% of the time. But like most men who go to court under the family law system in our country, I was left feeling criminalized, belittled, worthless, powerless and irrelevant. I have entered a world riddled with bias, prejudice, discrimination and hypocrisy. A world where under the guise of justice, children are stripped of their fathers, fathers of their children. This has to change. Going into the court, literally opening the door, a well-meaning clerk passed me by and he tapped me on the shoulder and he said, Good luck, Bob. I said, Yeah, thanks, Mike. And he said, listen, can I give you a bit of advice? And I said, yeah, please. And he said, whatever you do, don't say you love your children. I was taken aback. That was the sole defense I had, if defense is the correct word. And I said, why not? And he said, well, the court think it's extreme if a man articulates his love for his child. I was on telly one night, and I mentioned something about this. And what happens to men in this situation isn't right. The law is generally predicated against them. And over the next few months, I received what amounted to 70 plastic bin liners full of letters. Now, people have known me for almost 30 years now. And in all my time with the Boomtown Rats or Live Aid or whatever, I had never received that amount of Bob Geldof England type mail. I had no idea there were so many of us out there destroyed by this system. I'd unknowingly struck a chord with tens of thousands of fathers, grandparents, partners, all of them robbed of their children. Quite often drive in the area where I believe she lives, just in case I might see her. But I don't take any further than that. I'm not even sure I'd recognise her anymore, to be honest. I'm, I'm keeping all her cards and everything else. And one day when she comes and sees me and finds me, she will. Say, yeah, that's 
Jesus will done for you. The one thing that I couldn't buy is hearing my granddaughter say I love you now. Couldn't buy it. And it's dreadful. It really is dreadful. But it's the it's the double pain. It's the pain of my son, and it's my granddaughter's pain, and it's our pain. And the whole thing is just pain and hurt, and and all the all the mixed emotions that you go through. It is dreadful. It really is. Every year, what the government calls only 15,000 cases go to the family courts. In just 7% of those cases are men allowed to live with their children. The courts reduce the rest of them to Sunday fathers, dads who can only visit their kids at weekends. And they're the lucky ones. Four out of ten fathers lose touch with their children forever. What's going on? Why are we allowing this state-sponsored child abuse? I can't stand all this unnecessary pain. And so long as I think it's useful, I'll keep telling my story, even to the most unlikely of politically influential audiences. So whatever you do, don't say you love your children. The courts think it unhealthily extreme if a man articulates his love for his children. This stuff is important to all of us. One in four of all children now live in one-parent homes. Educational standard amongst children of divorced couples are at an all-time low. Children who grow up without fathers are five times more likely to be unemployed and three times as likely to get involved in crime. Eighty percent of all social housing is for single-parent families, and family breakdown costs the taxpayer at least fifteen billion pounds per year. These are the social and economic values of fatherhood. The emotional value is beyond calculation. I'm not a TV presenter. I'm not a journalist. I'm certainly no legal expert, and family law is not my field of expertise. But it is certainly my field of experience. We've all had enough. Fathers take to the streets. They climb cranes and resort to ever more extraordinary means to bring attention to their plight. Even the Prime Minister and Buckingham Palace were targeted. The frustration boils over, and membership of the many support and campaign groups is growing by the day. Why are you doing it? I do it because of a fundamental motivation out of the injustice of my experience at the hands of the family courts, and I'm doing it for my two children. I saw all these thoroughly decent, nice guys, love pouring out of them for their children. They've quite clearly done nothing wrong, and they've got involved in this surreal court system, out of which there seemed to be no um, escape. The injustice is so vile. And so, contrary to the, the best interests of the children, which the law suggests that it's supposed to serve, that you just have got to do something about it. It's so unfair what happens to thoroughly decent people that you, you can't actually stop till the job's done. The root of all this pain, this destruction of the soul, lies in a system hidden behind the high walls of the family courts, which decides the fate of our children. Perversely, in a democratic society, these courts operate in total secrecy. There is no way for us to find out how judges make their decisions. I do think we ought to know what's going on. That is one of my hobby horses. I think the family um, court is far too secret. But it seems to be this absolute reaction. We force the family courts. Not one will speak to us. Not one will speak to us. Not one. We've asked them all, not a single member, not out of the services, the social services, not out of the, the, the experts, not one. This is a nonsense. When a marriage ends, a couple may turn to the law to resolve disputes about their children. But almost immediately, they're sucked into an antiquated, secret family justice system where the dispute is inflamed further because of the adversarial nature of our law, which promotes discord, bitterness, rage, anger, and finally, 
hatred. It's a farce. The law claims to be gender neutral, but that's a lie. For nine times out of ten, the judge's decision will favor the mother. If they're lucky, dads, like a visiting uncle from Mars, will see their kids for contact every other weekend. So why does this happen? Why are fathers forcibly removed from their children? Why do we allow this, in effect, state-sanctioned kidnapping? The root of the problem facing fathers lies with one crucial phrase written into the law itself. The first line of the 1989 Children Act states that the best interests of the child are to be considered paramount. Now, this sounds fair enough, but in reality it's through this that a bias against the idea of men in the home has penetrated the family courts. The Children's Act states that um, the interests of the children will be served by this law, because it's called the Children's Act. For me, the problem is that the unspoken and indeed unwritten corollary of that clear statement is that the interests of the child are nearly always best served by the presence of the mother. Why are the courts so resistant to the fact that men are as capable at bringing up their children as a woman. Well, I, I find that very difficult to deal with. I think probably in many cases it's happened because one's, the courts have tended to equate young children with mothers for some reason. Well, that's a cultural, isn't it, a social thing? Yes, time. probably, yes. So no one is accountable for this reactionary, unfair, unjust, possibly illegal, and certainly illogical system which causes so much destruction. How can this be? While society is changing, what is uh, still the fact is that women take the prime responsibility for caring and bringing up their child. And that's still, you can see that in the patterns of work. You can see that in who's at the school gates picking up the children. Uh, you can see that in who takes the children to the, uh, to the doctors, uh, who takes the children to the dentist. When it comes to separation and divorce and determining the residence for a child, Interesting enough, if you actually look at the stats, you'll probably dispute this one, but the reality is that women on the whole, more women tend to apply for residence orders, more men tend to apply for contact orders. But if a man does want to fight for the right to be a parent, he'll face a bigger, more practical problem. By the time a case gets to court, most fathers will have left the family home for which he is still paying and be lucky to afford a bedsit or shared flat. By moving out, a father is in fact often sowing the seeds of his own downfall. Letting the children live alone with their mother will very quickly establish a living arrangement that the courts are reluctant to break up. When you're in a conflict situation and a judge has to determine the residence of the child, the judge in looking at the interests of the child would look for stability. So if the child is already living with a mum... What's his idea of stability? Well, if the child is already living with a mum, the judge may well decide that that's in the best interest of the child to continue. Well, that's wrong. Well, that, that's, that may be your view. No, now, no, how do we tackle that? View. Hang on. How do we tackle that? By speeding up the court processes and by trying to get mediation and conciliation in at an earlier stage. But why is this clearly failed, decrepit system been allowed to continue for so long, reinforcing the worst prejudices and injustices. It currently takes so long for cases to reach court that judges are even more unwilling to upset the living patterns, which is almost always that the child will be living with its mother. The status quo almost always happens simply because of the delay in getting to court. Yes. So the court itself imposes a status quo. So it's cash 22. This is one of the criticisms that judges have of the system. Delay. And it is outrageous. Uh, and it takes a year, sometimes longer, for the, ca for the case to come before the court. Now, that is wrong. I mean, take, for example, the re requirement to have a welfare officer's report. The government target is 12 weeks. Now that's three months before you get a report. In fact, it, it, it seldom takes three months. It usually takes four or five months. Can you just think, 20 weeks waiting for a report. 
once you've set foot outside that former family home, suddenly rights close like doors behind you. And um, what you thought was a, a sensible or reasonable or fair move for the children suddenly becomes uh, something that is just pushing you further and further and further. Going through this secret criminalizing system is a vile and frightening experience for all concerned. Men are left feeling worthless, belittled, impoverished and embittered. And despite the exhortations of the law, the interests of the child are usually forgotten by the system in the heat of a state-engendered hatred. You know, as explained to me, we're supposed to act in the child's best interests. Yet we spend tens of thousands of pounds. We inevitably wind up selling the family home to pay legal fees to fight it out in court over the children. How is that in a child's best interest? Who wins? Does mum win? No. Does dad win? No. That's a very strong Does a child point. win? No. Mm -hmm. Who wins? There's only one type of person wins. That's the legal. That, so that's a consequence. Why does that happen? It's a consequence of having an unclear law. What judges decide in 93% of all cases that come before them is that the children should live with mum and see dad in a few hours of state-sanctioned time on prescribed days, as though they were an occasional visiting uncle made strange by distance and uncomfortable by unfamiliarity. What happened to me was that not only is the time not enough, but that time is you're controlling the knowledge that they're going away from you in 30 seconds, 29, 25, 26. Mm. It's not that, wow, I've got an hour with them. It's that I've, I've only got an hour it's left. Got got, hour. And, and it's the dripping, the slow, corrosive drip of state-appointed time. And it's, it's the fixed time as well that's really upsetting. One father lived just one street away from the mother, and he saw the mother walking down the street with this little girl. And so she ran to him saying, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. And the mother literally pulled the child away from her father in the middle of the street. And, that the, and I've, that's happened on a number of occasions, clients tell me this is what's happened. And this, with the child so traumatised, it's just almost being dragged away from their father, and literally, because it's like it's not your contact time. You go to um, cafes and you look across and you see the man sitting there in the corner with the two kids in the wimpy bar or whatever, and you, you, just, you can just tell that that's that poor fellow who's seeing his kids for the weekend and he's got to take them out somewhere, he's got to make them happy. Uh, and, you're tr and that is the trouble when you're in that situation. You're trying so hard to make them happy that it often doesn't work. You know, you, just having the kids and trying, trying to make them happy and trying to give them all the things to do. Sometimes they just want to sit and watch the telly. They and I hate having to cram two weeks worth of time into one weekend. I'm absolutely exhausted at the end of it. In many cases, this so-called contact, this disgraceful notion and impertinent language of access between father and child will not involve an overnight stay. After their day out with dad, he's expected to get the children back to the mother's home in time for dinner. The terror of being that five minutes late can often mean a lawyer's letter chastising your parenting and threatening further withdrawal of your child. Not only is this heartbreaking, but more importantly, it causes immediate, long-term psychological damage to their children. The evening rituals are really very important emotionally, and being able to participate in um, uh, you know, getting the child bathed and uh, reading them stories and snuggling them to sleep in bed. But those are really precious moments for a parent and for a child. They are, they are part of the crucial glue that keeps those relationships going. And if you cut a parent out of those really precious moments, you diminish the opportunities to have a rich, deep, warm relationship. So this is the thing specifically that almost drove me, I mean, properly insane. Mm -hmm. I mean, the smell of my children in the house, you know, tucking them up. Right. Going into it, just make sure they're all right, kissing them good night, bathing, the bedtime story, the cuddles, the hot chocolate. I mean, that, that really almost drove me insane, that that had just gone like that. 
Easter, I remember staying overnight, and for the first time I tucked him into bed, and it was, it was pitiful, really, it really was, I had nothing. Um, and uh, I tucked him into bed, and they went off to sleep, and I just sat there and looked at, watched them all night. I just watched them sleep. You know, I hadn't seen this for six months, and been in this part of their life for six months, the, you know, tucking up to bed and sitting. I mean, my son was ten by then, but my daughter was only six. Um, and it was, I just remember sitting there in this squalid little bed sit, looking at them and, and thinking, you know, wow. The whole issue of how much contact fathers have with their children is bound up with this issue of their intimacy with the children and their keeping in touch as the children grow up. We've looked at a, a very large sample of families, around 10,000 families, in, in which we looked at mothers' reports of how well their children were doing after separation. And the, essentially the story was exactly the same, that the children who saw more of their fathers, who had frequent and regular contact with their fathers, who, were, who felt close and involved with their fathers, were doing much better in terms of adjustment. And there's completely clear, unequivocal pattern of results. So it's in everybody's interest, I think, for fathers to be being a parent, even if they're on their own. What's important is the um, continuation of the relationship uh, and preserving that stability. So if that, if that is the norm for those, those children, moving between their dads, their home with their dad, their home with their mum, that is as stable psychologically for them as any other domestic device. Well, and it doesn't have to have been the norm for the children. What's important is that the norm was that they had relationships with both parents. Um, uh, and it's preserving those relationships that's important. And I would argue that that's an issue of children's rights. The more family that a child's got in their lives, the more family they see, and the more you tell that child, oh, you're wonderful, what a beautiful girl, what a handsome little boy, how clever you are, you're going to be top of the class. The more you tell a child that, they will grow and have confidence and they'll feel stable and they'll grow up being a better person for that. The harm that this outdated, defunct family law causes to children, their fathers, and the extended families cannot be underestimated. Fractured families, scarred children, distraught grandparents. What have we become that we allow this system to continue when we know the damage that it's doing? It breaks our hearts, destroys our children, it's ruinous for society, it makes the culture vulgar and perverse. It costs a fortune, and it flies in the face of everything we know as humans, that children love both of their parents, and in turn, both of their parents love them. Life is empty and quiet. Um, and all those times when you go, God, just give me an afternoon um, breathing space, which most parents know, um, uh, I actually long for the mess and the chaos and all the things that go with it. The family justice system at its best will transform ordinary fathers into visiting Mac dads, but at its worst, the system and those who run it will cut the ordinary father out of family life entirely. Based on nothing more than outdated social stereotypes and despite everything that child experts say, the courts have become instruments of political social policy by insisting that the interests of the child are bound up in the best interests of the mother. So if you're a man, why have children if they're going to be taken from you upon separation? Why get married if for the rest of your life you become not much more than a wage slave simply in order to see your child a few minutes a year? I suspect that if the law were as tilted towards men as it is now to women, we would behave in the same way. So it's little wonder that many women are tempted to abuse the system all the while it works in their favour. I had one mother who said to me, tell, tell him, give me the money and he can have contact. I mean, you're in front of this woman who's saying, he can see the kids if he gives me money. Mm. I mean, do you not just go, you fucking bitch? 
Well, the problem is that when you're actually acting with someone, well, you probably do. You probably think I would. I'd be crap lawyer. <laughs> you think? Well, that's, this is this is the thing because you, when you're acting with someone, there are boundaries that you, the limits. What you can say, you can say, well, basically, I don't want to work for you anymore because I mean, if you're not going to take the. But I mean, internally, you. does your soul well, no, you not do, wither? Well, you do. This is why. This is why it's a thankless task, and that's why I don't want to actually work but in that see, environment. Uh, I equally think it's human, her reaction. Mm. The law is allowing her to do this. Women litigants uh, are becoming or have become adept at manipulating the system and the system is capable of being manipulated. And if someone is implacably hostile and simply won't give contact and, and uh, brainwashes the child against the father, then there's very little one can do. The judge makes an order for contact, the mother disobeys. What can the judge do? He can, he can fine the mother or send her to prison. Now, typically she's got no money, so the fine isn't a possibility. So, to send her to prison, what does that do for the children? The government is saying it will extend powers for judges beyond imprisonment. Uh, and the reason they're doing that is because now the mantra is, um, you know, if you put the mother in jail, how is that in the interest of the child? Well, it's in the interest of the child that when she gets out, she won't do it again. But the best this government can come up with, and this really does show the lack of intellectual rigor, the lack of imagination behind this claptrap, frankly, is that if a mother prevents contact, she might be made to pay the dad's expenses if he's booked a holiday. He doesn't want a fucking holiday. He wants to hold his child. Four out of ten mothers, that's 40%, admit to having obstructed contact between children and their fathers. And the family law system does nothing. Doing nothing nearly always means giving in to the mother, who of course is claiming all her demands are in the best interests of the children. It's a form of moral laziness. They, they, they just make the decision that uh, you know, mum's upset when dad has contact. Mum being upset is bad for the child. And so the court says, well, we better stop dad seeing child, even though he's done nothing wrong. I mean, that is a complete pattern. It happens time and time again. And it's actually the justification for taking a child overseas. Mum will be upset if she's not allowed to go and live in Australia. Therefore, she must be allowed to go and live in Australia. You know, we see that all the time, week in, week out. In my own case, I don't want to go on about my own case, but he lives in Japan, we have a great relationship. He came at Christmas, um, but I hadn't seen him for 18 months. And I'm entirely dependent on his mother's goodwill, whether or not he comes, there's absolutely nothing else I can do. I can talk to him on the phone and so on. Um, but, you know, there's just endless such stories. Do you have anxiety before he comes, or are you just, is it a longing, or is it a mixture? Actually, my God, this is crime, actually. Um, I mean, you know what happens is I don't actually. It's all off in a little zone somewhere, and I don't think about it. But I shut it out. And then when he comes, it's great. There we go, so I'll bottle it up again for another year. After taking his son away, Jim Parton's ex-wife changed his son's family name. You remove the final connection. You airbrush the past, and the father has disappeared. It's relatively easy for a mother to change their child's surname, and there's little a father can do in this situation. It's futile to turn to the law, as the law clearly does not protect men as our first woman law lord, Dame Brenda Hale, made very clear recently. She said uh, it was a very poor kind of parent um, who would insist upon calling the child by its own name. So not only had this man lost his last viable connection with his child in this particular case, but he had been told he was a bad dad for trying to keep any sort of relationship going. How devastating. It's a way of, uh, of excluding the father. And what does the father think? Why did the mother do it? It was for reasons to do with her, not, not to do with the child. 
And to, and to say that he was a bad father because he objected, I mean, I, I'm sorry, with every respect to a very senior judge, this judge <laughs> doesn't agree. There seems to be an old pervasive suspicion of men lodged deep within the family court system. It's based on some perverse notion that men themselves, by virtue of their masculinity, are unfeeling brutes, incapable of love or clear displays of affection. But with this sort of attitude, it's very easy for a woman to prevent a father from raising his child. And the quickest and easiest way to do this is to utter two magic words. Domestic violence, you, you must hear it all the time to stop um, dads from seeing their kids. Well, that's not the only sort of allegation. What about sexual abuse? Mm. It's very easy for the mother to, to say and very difficult for the father to disprove. The whole apparatus of the system based on nothing more than flagrant prejudice and clear discrimination and bias can bear down so strongly on a father that he will start to view his every action with doubt. Normal day-to-day -day behavior of a loving father becomes sinister and threatening. I felt very nervous when I slept with my little four-year-old when she came over and spent the night and she insisted on spending the night and I thought all hell's going to break loose now because she slept with us to the age of three people viewing this may have a, a view on that that's how we brought her up so when she said I want to go home with dad she just got into bed which is my bed that big empty thing that desert that I seem to occupy these days and um, and I was so panicky, and I really mean panicky, like, you know, like going like this, and I, maybe I shouldn't sleep there. And she said, come on, Dad. And I was just afraid that she'd go back, and the other side would say, knowingly, you know, because she knows, uh, do you see, and use that against me. Yeah, it's not something I would recommend to a client. There is a potential difficulty if a man who has recently separated from his partner, wife, whoever, and has his four or five year old child in the bed with him. But that, isn't that sad? Maybe. Over the last 15 years we have developed concerns about sexual abuse. We're actually not trustworthy as humans. We're somehow hairy and brutish. We've got this big thing between our legs that controls us. And if you're with a little child, your little child, and you're sleeping together, that somehow these uncontrollable man urges will suddenly rise to the fore. We have countless people at our meeting saying, you know, the, there are these sort of, perhaps not actual allegations, but suggestions out there. Yeah. And we have to say, well, you know, just be a bit wary about having your child in your bed. I know when my child but was... That is, is that crazy. is a disgrace. It is crazy, That is yeah. disgusting and a disgrace. Yeah. This is denied because well, we're men, you know, yeah. we don't do that sort of crap. I mean, my son, when we separated, he was four, and he was obviously, you know, he was disturbed about what was going on between his parents. He wanted to be in, in my bed, and I, I thought about the implications of it, and then, like you, I thought, ah, fuck it, no, he can stay there, that's fine, and uh, we'll take the consequences if someone raises uh, uh, an issue about it, which luckily they never did. But you have to say to people who come to our meetings, be careful, you know, because there'll be suggestions. In your experience, how many of the allegations of abuse or violence are substantiated? Well, I think that's a very difficult question. I would think probably not a lot. There is a great and terrible perversity that underlines all of this. The modern and unspoken sense that all men are violent, abusive thugs, despite the reality of the men in every woman's life, or indeed man's life, their fathers, brothers, uncles, sons, and lovers, and friends. All men with varying degrees of human complexity, pretty much like women, in fact, and all not bad people. The argument that you're incapable of bringing up a child because you're male, because you've got testosterone, I kind of hope it's, that's gone away because observationally it clearly isn't true anymore, but it lingers on in the family courts. And it baffles me, but, you know, fortunately I'm not a lawyer. You wrote, when it comes to understanding the conduct and character of men when compared to women, vulgar supposition is easier than objective measurement. That is, uh, where, that is absolutely right. I mean, it's a sort of, it's a sort of legal laziness, isn't yeah. it? 
While the courts maintain this outdated sugar and spice slugs and snails view of men and women, the rest of us have moved on. <laughs> Today's fathers are increasingly involved in raising their children. Are you going to eat any more, mister? Yeah? Or sit round properly, come on. And I just can't understand people saying that a woman can look after her child better than a man. That's, to me, that's a load of rubbish. You know, they do the same job as good as each other. There's a lot of women that can't bring up kids as well. It's not, it's not a sex-specific thing. It's a, it's a cultural thing. This antiquated, prejudiced, bias, discriminatory law must catch up with us. It must redress the balance and reflect the way that men and women choose to live now, how we wish to bring up children together, but perhaps in a different way. The family courts, with all their inefficiencies, have caused thousands of children such damage fathers such stress, such turmoil, that more and more men are simply giving up. The system is so stacked against them that fewer and fewer have the energy to even get to court in the first place. So Why is. don't more men go into the club? Well, because you know you're going to lose, so there's no point. I mean, if and the ministers tell you that, don't they? They do indeed. And you know, I mean, last week my car radio was stolen. Did I report it to the police? What would be the point? You know, um, the police aren't going to get my radio back, so I don't bother. In the same way, I don't bother to go to court if there's some difficulty over my contact because I'm stuffed in here. What's the point? And so I'm not part of that 10% who go to court, if you like, on, on a big issue like that. What the prime minister says, because he's advised to say it, is that well, look. It isn't as big a problem as it appears because the majority of men don't go to courts to challenge this. People no. settle it. Well, I mean, this assumes that men on separation say, you're getting the kids? Fine, great. Best of luck, love. I won't see my kids get... What? Right. I would suggest the true truth behind the figures is that most guys are not very happy seeing the most cherished things in their entire existence once a fortnight. No, they're not. And the majority will say that um, the time they have them is never enough. Every step of the way, you are emasculated, eviscerated, impediments put in your way, <laughs> stopped, played with, manipulated, shit upon, treated with contempt, mm -hmm. treated with derision, made to shut up, made to feel like an animal and a brute, never allowed to express the thing they say you don't have in the first place, your love for your child. When is this going to stop? All of it is, 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 is ludicrous fucking terminology for, for something that should actually just be about two people looking after their children. I don't keep me away from them because they don't deserve that. And actually, nor do I. I've done nothing wrong. And most of us haven't done anything wrong. I just used to come away from dropping my daughter off or something like this, or dropping my son off and um, pull into a gateway and, and pull my bloody eyes out. And um, difficult, it really is. I've had lots of days just sitting at the kitchen table with a can of beer crying for hours on end. The family justice system in this country is a farcical reactionary joke. It causes such pain that if it affected anyone else save children or more specifically their fathers, it would be a primary concern to the nanny impulses of this politically correct government. Fucking foxes get more consideration than fathers from this lot. Children must be returned to their families. Fathers must reclaim their children. This law stops them. Get rid of it. I propose we write new law to protect the rights of children to be with their dads 
equally where that is possible. A starting presumption stating that which is self-evident to everyone but the hacks in the family court system, that both parents are of equal value and in the eyes of the child usually equally loved. My suggestion is, and I think we've already gone through this, is that the law should state that where possible they are, and the end result is they will be with each parent 50% of the time unless they otherwise choose themselves. I don't have a problem with that. So, so you and I would draft a law which said unless the circumstances uh, indicate otherwise, the uh, starting point is equal division of time. I think it's fairer. I think it would be much more sensible. I think it would take a lot of the heat out of the situation. I think it would put people on a much more even footing. And it also then they would think very carefully about what they're doing when they do split. Because at the moment it's too easy. And, it, and, it, and, the, and the trauma that's caused by the current system is just appalling. I think that would take, I think it would help enormously. This summer, the government published its proposals in the form of a green paper, a consultation document that may eventually become law. There are plans to encourage mediation, speed up the court process and provide contact centres. And though this may have some marginal benefit, the reality of this paper is that bureaucrats have listened to other bureaucrats' complaints of an overwhelmed system. As ever, people have been ignored. They refuse point blank to even consider allowing fathers to be with their children for 50% of the time, wherever that's possible. We're absolutely clear that the current system is not working anywhere like adequately enough. Um, we are not saying things are fine. This is why we're setting out what we think is a, a radical um, process of change. But it doesn't do that one thing it doesn't say, and it needs to be said, upon separation the children will be with both parents equally 50% of the time where possible. Nothing wrong with that at all. What we don't want to do though is to say that that's what everybody should be doing. Why the hell should the state be saying every child should be spending 50% of its time with one parent and 50% of another? I don't actually of expect that to happen. Uh, I expect okay. it to happen You're extremely rarely. It's neutralising the negotiating position. It is, yes. and it's okay. the backstop. You see, your prob my problem with this is that you're putting people in the state more for the rest of their life. You're putting them in the system like criminals. And everything we've talked about are systems of the state, you know, there's, there's this, then you have to report to judges who can then call you in and have you referred, and then there's welfare officers and mediators examining you to find you're wired, that sort of person. It's very Orwellian, and the endless interference, because you've just broken up with your missus. Fuck off. Get out of my life. You know, that's it. And save yourself a few quid in the bargain, the state. You know, I, I generally, what's the problem? What we believe the law says currently, and what we'll be saying again and again, is that we want um, the way in which parents behave and the way in which the law is worked out in practice um, to reflect cooperative parenting. Well, what the research tells us, it's not contact per se which makes for uh, the best outcomes for the children. It's the quality of the contact. So it's not just, you know, divvying the child up. The idea that we can have a one-size-fits-all won't work. Well, I, I won't let you get away with that because I keep hearing that from you guys. It's not a one-size-fits-all. I keep explaining that 50-50 is the bot. That is, we desire that to be the end result, that the children are raised brought up by both parents equally contributing your to the well-being of this child. Your way of doing it won't achieve your objective. You'll end up with just more litigation and just more conflict within the courts. Well, the minister is right that in most couples' lives, the woman will still do the bulk of the domestic work. She is wrong in assuming that this must continue upon separation. Like the courts, the minister is defending the past. She, like they, seem to be unable to understand the present or imagine the future. The point is that if men were allowed to be with their children, they too would be caring for them. This will happen in our time, but not when a government pursues outdated modes of social policy.
But what this is, is a tinkering with a wholly prejudiced, discriminatory, biased, inadequate and unjust system. And an unthinking tinkering with family law becomes unjustified tampering with people's lives. So stop tinkering, stop messing, tear down this law and start again. Because what fathers and mothers and grandparents and more specifically children need is the presumption that when you split up, when you separate, that the kids need to know that they will be with their mum and their dad half the time, where that's possible. If it's not possible, let's work something else out. Why not? The tens of thousands of men, women, fathers, mothers, grandparents, sisters, brothers, new wives, who've written to me, have been betrayed by this disgusting law. And until this disgrace has been torn up and rewritten, the letters and the pain will not stop. My response is not to read the letters anymore, you know. Once you identify with the first dozen, and then you realize the next dozen are worse, and then it goes on being worse and worse. I edit the magazines so I hear their stories and write them up in as dispassionate a manner as I can. But when it comes to my own sort of um, sadness, it's actually, I mean, 99% of the time you, you, you kind of wouldn't know, I think. And then just suddenly, from nowhere, you know, perhaps it's the intensity of this discussion we've been having, you know, suddenly hits you. Well, you have to suppress it, don't you? I mean, the, the only way you can survive, because mm. otherwise you'd be a basket case. Uh, you yeah. Know. Uh, you, you have to suppress it somewhere. Denial, yeah. And that's why I say cruel and inhuman. Yeah. They, they don't know what they're doing when these judges are making the decisions that they're making. They just don't know what they're doing to people. In the end, I did end up with um, the children 50% of the time. It worked okay. Um, it probably would have gone on to be fine, uh, except, of course, in our particular case, there were the finally the tragic circumstances of Paula's death. But I'm fine now. The kids are fine. But I and they will never forgive what this state, through this law, did to us to ruin our family even further than our own self-inflicted damage. What has to happen is that men must be allowed their dignity. They must be allowed to be with their children. So let's repeat what the feminists did in the 60s. They made the personal political and there is nothing more personal than being with your children. The law is profoundly flawed, so translate your grief into action, let your loss move you, make your dismay and hurt felt, literally demonstrate your love for your children so that even if they cannot see you, they can see you love them. What choice do they leave you? Speak your unsayable pain and articulate the real love that dare not speak its name, that of a father for his children, and no law should stand that serves to stifle this. Since this program was made, one of the interviewees, Alan Levy QC, has sadly died. For more information about the UK's child residence laws and advice on shared parenting, visit channel4.com slash family. Next tonight, we hear from couples, including the ones who provoked a media storm to see if wife swap changed their marriage. <laughs>